Closed session items. The public will be given the opportunity to address the board on closed session agenda items. Remarks shall be limited to three minutes per person. The board reserves the right to limit public comment beyond a total of 15 minutes per agenda item. Directions on how to submit a comment are available at www.pvpusd.net slash feedback. Ms. Westcott, do we have any public comments on closed session items? We have no public comments. Thank you. We will now recess to closed session and to discuss the following items. Conference with labor negotiator, public employee discipline dismissal release, Conference with legal counsel, anticipated litigation. Significant exposure to litigation pursuant to subdivisions D2 and E2 of Government Code Section 54956.9. Facts and circumstances withheld due to student privacy rights pursuant to 20 USCA 1232G FERPA and Education Code 49060 at Conference with legal counsel, existing litigation, significant exposure to litigation pursuant to subdivisions D2 and E2 of Government Code Section 54956.9, three cases. Snyder v. Powell's First Peninsula USD, LASC, case number 20STCV48622. Butler v. Powell's First Peninsula USD, case number 21TRCV00016. In the matter of Palace Furnace Peninsula Unified School District property at 32201 Forestal Drive, Rancho Palace Furnace, California. We estimate to reconvene at 6.30. The time is 7.03, or 7.04 p.m. Uh, we would like to start with the Pledge of Allegiance to the Flag, and that will be led by board member Gandhi's children, Amari and Alina. Would you please come up? And mom can join you. What's that? Well, the American flag is here, and... Uh, So I want to make sure we get a good view of them with the, with the American flag. Okay, so put your microphone on. Okay, and then you guys, if you would please, say to the microphone. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Outstanding. Hey, buddy, I like uh, that we're, we're Band-Aid buddies here. We both have uh, hurt our fingers. <laughs> I did two fingers. I did two fingers. I was. I behaved. He just okay. used one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't notice. All right. Thank you very m much, Amari and Alina, and thank you for sharing your mom with us now, as she sits as our newest board member. We are so happy to have her. And thank you, sir. Okay. In closed session. The, the board approved uh, 5 0 to approve. Do, 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 do. I'll try to find the case number. I think it was a uh Case number two zero two one zero five zero one. Okay, thank you. So the two zero two two zero one zero five zero one two zero one zero five zero one. With the roll call vote as follow: Ami Gandhi, aye. 
Rick Phillips, aye. Linda Reed, aye. Megan Crawford, aye. And Matthew Brock, aye. Okay, so before we move on to the approval of the agenda, there is a typo on the recommended action for item J9. The recommended motion should read that the board approve the recommendation to adopt Savas Learning Company's World History, the Modern Era, California Edition for use in World History beginning in the 21-22 school year. Is there a motion? I move that the board approve the agenda for the regular Board of Education meeting of May 26, 2021 as amended with item with agenda item J9 recommended action to read that the board approve the recommendation to adopt Savas Learning Company's World History, the Modern Era California edition for use in world history beginning in the 2021-2022 school year. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded. A roll call vote, please. Yes. Linda, can you hear us? Um, I can hear you uh, and my colleagues, but I cannot hear whoever is calling for the vote. Sorry, but I'm an eye on this one. I is your is your microphone button pushed? Okay. The PVP USD Media is muted. I don't know if that makes a difference on the Zoom or not. Okay. Uh, so that motion carries five zero. Public communications. Uh, I believe we have a speaker or not. We have two speakers on non-agenda items. Okay, would you please let them in? The public will be given the opportunity to address the board at this time on topics not listed on this agenda. Remarks shall be limited to three minutes per person. The board reserves the right to limit public comment beyond a total of 15 minutes per agenda item. The board cannot engage in public discussion during this portion of the agenda due to the Ralph M. Brown Act. That's government code sections 54950 through 54963. Our first speaker is Alan Siegel. Mr. Siegel, you're up, sir. You have three minutes. Uh, I'll be brief. Uh, thank you very much, uh, members of the board, uh, for your thousands of hours for the betterment of the district and its students. It's much appreciated. Uh, I'm a 30 year Peninsula resident. I'm a father of two K through 12 graduates. I'm speaking tonight on behalf of Palos Verdes American Youth Soccer Organization, AYSO, of which I've been a volunteer uh, for 20 plus years. I didn't realize that was gonna be on my background behind me, but it uh, sort of makes a statement as well. Uh, I'm talking tonight about the April 28th meeting. The agenda item was the Malaga Cove Little League expansion. And in my personal opinion, the discussion centered on the process of how to do the expansion with the regulatory agencies and the city of Palos Verdes Estates, but little discussion of whether there's a very hard. Uh, Mr. Siegel, if you can hear me, you've, your internet has, or our internet, one of us has uh, glitched out a little bit. Yeah, I can still see Sarah Tilly and Linda moving. <laughs> okay, uh, we will come back to Mr. Siegel to let him finish his comments. Uh, who is our next speaker, please? Scott Ellis is our next speaker. Okay, thank you. Will you let him in, please, and let him begin. Oh, my goodness gracious. Welcome, sir. Am I, am I on? Yeah, you can hear me? Okay. Uh, wow, it is awesome to be back in this room with everybody. Can you hear me? Uh, Linda, you can hear me, right? Or Ms. Ms. Reed, sorry. <laughs> All right. um, okay, good. Um, so it's really great to be back in this room. Um, and for those of you that don't know, uh, all the board members, uh, Sans, Ms. Reed, uh, are here tonight. Um, so... Uh, thank you for being here, and it's great to be in this chamber with you guys again. Um, 
I, I'll, I'll be brief. I just want to talk about um, some things that I've, I've heard uh, in the area as far as, um, as far as our district compared to other districts that um, I'd just like to speak about very briefly, and it has to do with health care and, um, and where we stand in relation to other districts and the health care that they're providing for their faculty. Um, and, um, and it's the gap between our district and other districts is pretty large as far as as far as health care coverage is concerned. Other districts are upwards of eighteen, nineteen thousand dollar caps, where, where ours is just above eight thousand um, dollars, which doesn't really reflect how I know you feel about uh, the PVFA um, and the teachers um, in the district and, and the the quality of service that we provide for the families and for the students. Um, and, and I think that we should be um, at least on the level of, of all the other districts as far as that uh, healthcare coverage is concerned. Um, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't reflect, I, I think uh, the way I feel, it doesn't really reflect well on the district from, from other people's perspective when they know that. And, it, and as a PVFA member, um, it doesn't make us feel, or me, I can't speak for everybody, but it doesn't make me feel um, that, that, that I'm being uh, appreciated and compensated fairly in relation to other districts. And like, we need to retain all the teachers that we have, all the great, wonderful, uh, talented teachers that we have. And if we're not meeting the same, uh, the same coverages, the same basic uh, coverages uh, as other districts, they're not gonna want to come here. They're not going to want to stay here. And, and, I, and I really do fear that. I fear that people are going to leave, especially since teachers, uh, the, the attrition rate has been so high. There are positions now in other districts, and there is a danger that our teachers will leave the district to go somewhere else because they're better compensated. And, and as a district, I don't think we can afford to lose that, that type of uh, uh, workforce. Um, so I think that's something to consider. Um, for you to, to, to communicate with your, your bargaining teams, uh, to bargain with our teams and get this done in a timely manner, um, fairly, um, so that we can move forward and continue um, doing what we do without fear of losing any more staff and that the staff feels that they're fairly compensated for the services provided. That's all. Thank you for your time. Well, thank you for coming down tonight. As you know, we can't discuss it because of the Brown Act. Um, but had you actually talked about this during, right before close, we could have actually talked to you about it. Just let you know for, for next time if you wanted to actually engage in conversation. Yeah, you know, I just, it, it's just more of, it's more of like me just wanting to communicate uh, my feelings to you guys. That's all. Oh, well, that's, um, that's, and like, totally good, totally good. And I'm not that. a bargaining member, so <laughs> I, I just can't don't want really you to do think anything. we're not listening to you, but we just, we can't talk to you. That's all. Okay. Shall I try Mr. Siegel again? I'm sorry? Shall I try to admit yes, Mr. Siegel again? All right, Mr. Siegel, you're back. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. I, I, I don't know exactly where I cut off, but I was introducing myself and saying I'm a 20 year volunteer with AYSO. Um, Moving on, the April 28th discussion of the Malaga Cove Little League expansion, I think, centered on the process of how to do the expansion with the regulatory agencies and the city of Palos Verdes Estates, but little discussion of whether this is the right thing to do. I uh, just want to remind the board that AYSO is a very interested party in this discussion. We use the Malaga Cove fields through three seasons of soccer. In addition, the fields there are used as overflow practice fields for the high school teams. And also in the summertime, the Hillside Alliance uses those fields to train high school students as well. Uh, in addition, the Malaga Cove area there at, at the administration building provides a, a much needed park setting on that side of the peninsula. I see families flying kites there, throwing footballs and the cross balls, and generally enjoying the breezes provided by the open space. If it's decided to do the construction of another little league field on that open space grass field, you're basically making a hundred year decision. Once you put in metal backstops, concrete areas, raised pitching mounds, outfield fencing, you're blocking out other uses of the space. It's very unlikely that that would be converted to any other use in the future. 
in our opinion, before this project is green lit to spend staff time on the process of permanently converting this to a single purpose use, the board should step back and discuss what is your process for making land use decisions. In other words, how should the district land best be used for the benefit of the district and the community and get the appropriate community input before you go down the path of forming ad hoc committees to implement to what seemed like almost a done decision at the April 28th board meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Siegel. Uh, and to clarify though, that was how do we proceed so that we can listen to the community? That was not by any means a decision to move forward. Just clarifying that that was a decision, you know, how do we best listen to the community? Agreed. So, thank you so much for being here tonight, sir. Thank you. Okay, is there a motion to approve the Board of Education meeting minutes for May 12, 2021 as presented? So moved. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Roll call vote, please. Ms. Crawford? Yes. Ms. Gandhi? Mr. Phillips? Aye. Ms. Reed? Yes. Mr. Brock? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, now is there a motion to approve the Special Board of Education meeting minutes for May 17, 2021, as presented? So moved. Second. Roll call vote, please. Ms. Crawford? Yes. Ms. Gandhi? Mr. Phillips? Aye. Ms. Reed? Yes. Mr. Brock? Aye. Motion carries. Board president announcements? Tonight's Board of Education meeting is being recorded and live streamed via a link on the district website. Elementary Enrichment Program is now offering classes for elementary students during the spring session. To register for the virtual classes, please visit www.pvpusd.net slash enrichment. Enrollment for our 21-22 school year is now open. Please go to our website for more information. PV Kids Corner will be offering a summer 2021 program beginning June 21st, 2021. So mark your calendars. Watch our PV Kids Corner summer program information on our website at www.pvpusd.net slash pvkids. Peninsula Education Foundation will be offering summer school. Please visit www.pvpss.com for more information regarding course offerings and registration dates. Households with a child who is approved to receive free or reduced price school meals are eligible for the emergency broadband benefit. Households can receive a monthly discount of $50 per month on internet service and associated equipment, as well as a one-time discount of $100 for a connected device, such as a laptop or desktop computer. For more information and to apply for the free and reduced price meal program, visit the food services website, which is accessible under the parents and students section of the district website. And via Zoom, uh, would you please let the... Sorry, Mr. Brock, I just have a quick question. Just going back to the minutes really quick. Did I miss something? Um, no, I was just wondering if, if Ms. Gandhi should actually abstain on those if she wasn't technically on the board yet, or... Well, I believe she was here to... W this great well, question, to... but I believe she was here to witness the meeting, and then to, she had a copy of them. I think it was the May 17th one she was here, but the May 12th one. Uh, it's up to it's up to Ami whether what she wants to okay. do. Okay, I just wanted so. to. I was just thinking about that, and whatever is correct, I just wanted to bring it up. I, I think the the only drawback would be if somebody were to say that the minutes were wrong, then Ami, you would have to defend why you thought the minutes were were right, and in that likely scenario, yeah. So let's. I think we're good. Um, now, if we can move on, please, to the report of the Palos Verdes Faculty Association, PVFA leadership, Ms. Patty Petrucci. But thanks, Megan. Hey, that was a good Man, good I think you, you skipped over the student board members, Sarah and Tilly, who are on there. No, 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 no. No, I'm not. <laughs> Sorry, and I know, is it Tilly? You have somewhere you have to go. Or you were already supposed to be there, but we're running so late. So I'm sorry. You guys go. Okay, I can go first. Um, so this week is Pride Week at Peninsula. We're having activities every day, which 
teach equality and inclusivity led by the students in our GSA club. So we're so proud of them for putting that together during this difficult year, providing virtual and in-person options during school lunches and things like that. So that's been a super cool thing to see this week. Um, last week on Wednesday, we had our senior ditch day and cap and gown pickup, which was super fun for the seniors. Um, and we also had prom last Saturday, which was super fun. And I know both Sarah and I had a great time. <laughs> um, so that was super successful. Um, there was a choreo show for Coed Choreo, Choreo Company, our dance teams on campus last Thursday and Friday. People came out on the football field, socially distanced, super safe, super fun um, to give those students the opportunity to have their last dance of the school year. Um, so that was a super cool event. And tonight we have our coffee house, our open house, where I mean, or our open mic night where seniors are going to come in the amphitheater and just perform um, in front of each other, which is always a super fun and sentimental event because it's the last one for seniors. Um, moving on past events, I just want to congratulate Akash, Vivian, Ox, and Jennifer Liu because they performed as finalists in the Regeneron, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, International Science and Engineering Fair this year. We're just so proud proud of them for, for competing and, and doing so well. Um, and moving on to sports news, our girls basketball team won against PV, which makes them the reigning Bay League champs. And we're so proud of them um, for, for doing so well. And tomorrow they have their first playoff game at Peninsula. Um, so we're really excited to see how they do. Um, and yesterday or the day before, I believe, our varsity girls tennis team won CIF as a whole um, for another year. So we're so proud of them as well um, for fighting so hard to win and sustain that title. Um, tomorrow we have two big events. The service learning leadership class is doing a blood drive with UCLA all day at Peninsula near the field house. And there's the Look Fashion Show. So both of those things are um, events that community members like anyone who's watching could come out and support. Um, the look starts at 530 and the service learning blood drive is all day. And finally, I just wanted to say another reminder that the PVPHS drama department is putting on their Forbidden Broadway show. It's still streaming on the 11th, 12th and 13th and you can still get your tickets. So I wanted to put that out there. Everyone has just been super excited for all these end of year events um, and it's going well. Graduations in 15 days. <laughs> um, Sarah, do you wanna go on to PV? Sure, <clears throat> sorry. Um, first and foremost, on behalf of Tilly and I, we just wanna welcome Ms. Gandhi to the Board of Education and we look forward to uh, seeing what you do in the future. Um, as Tilly said, this past week was prom and everybody had such a great time. So thank you to both PV, PHS and PVHS ASBs for putting together such a great event. Uh, this past week was Trade Wind Slam Poetry Night. So this is an annual event where students and uh, yeah, students are able to share their poetry um, with their classmates and perform it live on stage. Uh, ASB just announced that we're gonna be having a glow coming, homecoming with games, food trucks, and carnival rides. So that'll be uh, lots of fun for all grades. In sports news, we wanna say congratulations to the, to the teams that have made it to CIF playoffs. Boys tennis just won their game today to make CIF championships. They won against Loyola, so congratulations to them. And the boys basketball game is underway currently. So good luck to them as well. Tryout to the annual tryouts for the annual Project Runway Fashion Show is going to be this Friday, and it's always for such a great cause. So we're excited to see everybody who participates strut their stuff on the runway. Uh, if you want, if you would like to be a Red Tide captain for next year, so if you want to be the student leaders in the student section, hyping everyone up, leaving them in cheers and things like that. There will be a mandatory meeting on Thursday for anybody who's interested. The PVHS Point, which is the school newspaper, just released their final issue of the newspaper last week. And the newspaper has the official senior map. Uh, so if you have any uh, peers or family friends uh, who go to PV, you can check out the senior map to see where they'll be going to college or what their future plans are. Finally, um, the drama department did a great job putting on their spring musical year in town. Um, it was streaming and it is now on demand for purchase. So if you missed uh, the live the live streams, uh, it's now available for you to purchase and watch anytime you want. 
Um, and One Hill Project News, we do have applications open for people who would like to join next year. So please sign up. I believe they're due on June 6th. And that's all for our report. Thank you. Uh, at this time, um, with uh, Ms. Petrucci and Ms. Uh, Lewis's permission, I would like to ask Dr. Chernis to go ahead and present the student certificates. So, Sarah and Tilly, uh, I feel sorry for the student board members next year that have to replace you guys. Um, you have done an amazing job. Uh, you really raised the bar on, on what it is to be a student board member. Your contributions to this board, to the community, to the students has been incredible. Um, and now you have a legacy. The One Hill Project is something that's going to continue, and someday you're going to get to tell your friends and your friends who have kids in school, oh, yeah, I started that. So hopefully it keeps going. Um, at this time, I'd like to present to you um, a certificate. So this is to Sarah Liu, student board member 2021, in appreciation for and recognition of your student leadership on the Board of Education, May 26, 2021. And this presented to Tilly Safavian in appreciation for and recognition of your student leadership on the Board of Education in 2000, uh, 2021 on May 26, 2021. And then board members. Yep. And we'll be sure to send these certificates to you. Um, and uh, it's been a pleasure working with you. So thank you. As Alex said, you've, uh, I think, totally redefined and raised the bar for the job. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I really. I hope you stay in touch because I'm really wondering what the, both of you do uh, in your future because you have made such an impact this year and especially in a year where um, I think it was so important for us to hear the student voice with all the various things going on with COVID and the adjustments that we made. But uh, you know, even if it hadn't been a COVID year and you had done the things that you did, it, it would have been amazing. Uh, and doing it in a COVID year of the pandemic made, made it that more incredible. And I really thank you for all that you've done for both of your schools, for the whole community, and for the district. And I really am excited for your futures. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Phillips. Ms. Crawford? Yeah, pretty much Dr. Trinis and uh, Mr. Phillips kind of said everything. But you both have done such an amazing job. Uh, so happy that you have been on the board with us the past year and I really like how this year we have kind of utilized the student preference vote as well um, and I think that's something that that will continue but definitely your work on the One Hill project um, has been quite an accomplishment and has really given uh, a major kind of um, impact for student voice and that's kind of been missing I feel like so it will will only um, continue and I wish you success in your future, and I know that you both will, um, you know, do great things. And uh, just good luck, and please stay in touch with us. Thank you so much for all of your work. Ms. Gandhi, would you like to say anything? Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you so much, and I hope that I get to meet you guys sometime soon. So thank you for everything. Ms. Reed? Um, so what I'd say briefly, first of all, is thank you for being role models yourselves for the next generation of women leaders in our, our community. And um, what strikes me both, I don't know if you knew each other before this, but um, maybe maybe you've been friends since you were five, but I have a feeling you probably haven't known each other all that long. And um, how collaborative you were, um, I think it sets a great, great example for how Penn and PV students can work together. And you're still allowed to tease each other about who won the girls' basketball game and who won the boys' basketball game. But but um, you do it with great humor, and, and ultimately you're looking out for what's best for all the students in our district. And I really appreciated your collaborative approach. So thank you both. And definitely stay in touch. I always like to see how our student board members are doing off in college and Tell us, send us little notes and come visit us over the holidays and uh, we'll miss you both. Thank you, Ms. Reed.
eh, you guys are all right. It's fine. You know, this today I was actually thinking, it's like, what am I going to say? You guys are so impressive. I couldn't think of what to say. Uh, my board members were nice enough to say it for me already. But it was just this idea that we've had board, student board members who have built upon the board members that came before them. And you guys took it to a whole new level. And I am so grateful that we had you as our student board reps this year. I do feel sorry for the ones next year because we're going to be expecting a lot out of them. I wish you guys both the absolute best of luck. Tilly, I hope uh, I get to give you your diploma over at Penn. And uh, Sarah, you know, I, I think, is that Rick and, uh, and Linda? So they can fight over who gets to give you theirs. So uh, you two, I am so, so impressed by you. And um, the community is as well. I, mean, I cannot, uh, you know, I, I, I don't ever remember hearing so much positive feedback about our student board members. And as I said, that legacy you leave behind, you're going to be able to look back at that in years. And although you'll have many other successes, you'll remember that one with fondness. Thank you both so much. Have fun at your open mic night tonight, Tilly. Are we doing a little, what are we doing tonight? A little. It's our coffee house event. Um, and thank you so much, everyone, for the kind words. But I don't think Sarah and I could ever take credit for everything that we did together this year. The One Hill Project, the students in the One Hill Project have been so incredible. Dr. Chernis and especially our school administration, Dr. K, Dr. Tyner, all of the assistant principals who helped out. We we're really just kind of the messengers <laughs> um, and, and we worked really hard this year, but it's the teams behind us that made it all happen. So thank you to everyone who helped us out um, and mentored us this year um, and I also just want to say thank you to Sarah because Sarah you have been so incredible um, you inspire me every day such a great speaker and you taught me a lot about what it means to be a leader so you've been a great person to be a co-board member with and thank you to everyone else on the board for being so incredible yeah, just echoing what Tilly said. First of all, thank you, Tilly. That means so much. I remember when I found out that Tilly was going to be the Penn board member, I was a little bit freaked out because I already knew that she had like such a great reputation. And I remember her from middle school, like being like the student leader. So to be able to share this position with her has just been so fantastic and so rewarding. And I'm so proud of what we've been able to do together. So thank you so much. Um, and then also thank you to the board for being so receptive to what we had to say. I know that normally this the the position isn't really doesn't really go like this, but we're really glad that we were able to have the opportunity and the platform to share uh, both what we thought and then most importantly share what our classmates thought as well. Um, and like Tilly said, it wasn't just us; it really takes a whole village. Um, so thank you to our classmates for always being receptive to you know answering our questions, and to our teachers and administrators for being so supportive. So thank you. Gracious as always. Thank you both so much. Uh, you're welcome to stay. And uh, but I think you got more fun things to do, Tilly. Uh, just just guessing. Just guessing. Bye. Have a good night. Okay. Thank you, Miss Petrucci, for waiting. Is she? There she is. This will be a report of the Palos Verdes Faculty Association leadership. Ms. Patty Petrucci. Good evening. Good evening, Dr. Chernis, members of the board, district administrators, and members of the community. First of all, on behalf of PBFA, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to our newest member of the board, Amy Gandhi. Amy, we look forward to working with you. So nice to see some people. I see Joan over there in the board right board room. Hopefully the next meeting I can be live as well. My message tonight is very brief. This school year has certainly been the longest and most challenging for all of us here tonight. Through it all, PBFA, PBFA teachers have stepped up and met all of the challenges which they were faced with in the most professional manner. 
I certainly do not want you to believe to think that I'm attempting to bargain outside of the bargaining table. However, early on in the fall in our meetings and teacher meetings with Dr. Chernus, he shared with the teachers that if there ever was a time for a raise, it is certainly now. I don't know whether members of the community are aware of the fact that PVFA, te PVFA teacher salaries and benefits have been historically substantially lower than our colleagues across the South Bay. We know that the money is there in reserves as well as one-time money. So on behalf of PVFA, we ask the district and the Board of Education to negotiate quickly and fairly with our bargaining team and also factoring the cost of living in order to provide us with benefits and wages that are comparable to our neighboring districts. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Petrucci. Is this your last meeting with us? No, it isn't. I hope to be live the next one. Oh, that's right. You, uh, <laughs> you know what? The, the brain doesn't always work. Couple, couple couple more. It's okay. Good. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad because, uh, you know, I really appreciate your leadership throughout this last year. So I'm glad we have you for a little bit longer. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we will next move on to Joan Lewis for the report of the Powell's Virtus chapter one, two, three, the California school employees association. Oh my goodness. You brought it. <laughs> So sorry, I didn't know if Sarah and Tilly were still on, but they're Raiders from Ridgecrest, and I just have to say, go Raiders forever. <laughs> so proud and happy of them. Anyway, good evening, everyone. Mr. Brock, members of the board, Dr. Turnus and Cabinet, and welcome, Ms. Gandhi. Nice to meet you. Um, so great to be in person, except I feel like I'm at a bank. I don't know. I'm not sure. <laughs> I brought my friend with me today, okay, um, because... We kind of feel a little disjointed at this time of year and a little broken and a little worn out, which he definitely is. Um, however, there's a big but to that, and that's because every day we wake up and every day I think to myself, and I know others do too, that I've got my agenda for the day. I know what we're going to do. And every day that agenda just gets blown up and it gets broken. The best laid plans don't happen. But I just wanted to share with you guys tonight um, how your classified staff successfully pivots regularly and changes during their day. Um, these are just the last couple of days, actually. Um, at M&O and custodial sites, they have what's called a run for the day. They have their basic uh, set of what's to happen. It's how they support classrooms and students until a restroom overflows or the pipes clog or there's a giant bloody nose in a bathroom which locks a bathroom down, which I know sounds trivial, but it is not trivial when you have, you know, 500 to 900 or more students on a campus. It just redirects their schedule every day and they pivot on it and they take care of it. Or it's the end of um, last minute planning because there's additional setup and breakdowns following COVID guidelines that end up on the calendar. Sometimes that's just bad planning, but when it does happen, one school recently held an awards banquet on the cliffs. That school did not have an available cart that was able to carry tables and chairs. So what did the staff do? We, they put it in their cars and they just hauled it over to the cliffs and got it all set up so they could support the students and the teacher who was trying to do an awards banquet and say thank you in a beautiful location. That's just who we are and that's what they do. Your librarians and technology aides we will be careful around them right now. They're being very creative. <laughs> um, they're having a massive effort to get textbooks back and Chromebooks, okay? They have done things like initiate drive-bys where the students drive into the parking lot, they put their student ID number up on their windshield. When they drive up and stop, they pop their trunk. Classified staff runs over, grabs what belongs to PVPUSD, takes down the number, logs it, scans it in, and the kids go on. So. It is very creative things that we are doing to get through the rest of this school year. Uh, clerical staff, um, I won't look over at Ms. Tronis because we've been in training for months on the LACO move to the BEST program. Um, it's accounting and purchasing, of course, I'm sure you're aware of. Right now, it feels like a daunting challenge. 
Um, and I just want to thank the administrative services staff because it's new to all of us. We, I feel like this sometimes. I have not put through a successful purchase order yet, but I am personally still using the practice sessions so that I can morph to this new system along with the district on LACO. Your attendance clerks have had an extraordinary year. Um, they have monitored period by period attendance and verifying student absences. I know it sounds trivial. It is not trivial at all. Currently, there are several schools working with the auditors. They are online with the auditors, and they are scanning, and this is, this is a direct quote, 600 documents for one school to support and verify why a student was out period three or period five or all day long. Um, and we understand that. That's what auditors do. Normally, they sit next to us, and we just show the paperwork. But it's just become a much larger process, which we understand this year. Um, yes, parents, I want you to know those handwritten notes, even the tiny little ones on yellow pads, are really important to us. That is the documents that these people are looking for, and we verify them, and we keep them for five years. So your attendance clerks need to be applauded because they have plowed through a difficult time, as everybody else has. It's also awards time. Um, today, the, um, our school, Ridgecrest, had honorary service awards, but I know other schools also are, and they are honoring their classified staffs for all that they have done to support their students and their programs all year long, 120%. Uh, of course, your food service personnel has never stopped. I think they don't get to stop till maybe 2022 when the funds run out. I don't know. But uh, they're there every day, and they're still nailing it, and they're still feeding the public, and the kids have the grab-and-go and are happy as can be. So I just wanted to say we're here for the big win. I know that the geniuses at maintenance and operations are going to take my friend, and they're going to be able to put him back together so we can get another year out of him. Um, but also I want you to know that you can count on classified staff to keep it together too. We do, as Ms. Petrucci uh, recognized, we are all still in negotiations. I won't bring any of that up here, but we are looking to negotiate a fair and reasonable response to um, compensation for all employees, and I appreciate your time. Thank you, Ms. Lewis. It was great to see you and Patty recognized today at the uh, Ridgecrest HSAs. So congratulations on that, and thank you for spending your time with us tonight. Okay, Dr. Chernis, report of the superintendent. Thank you, President Brock, members of the school board. At last week's special board meeting, Ms. Ami Gandhi was appointed to the Board of Education. She took her oath at the meeting, but tonight we'd like to formally uh, welcome her to the board. Uh, we had the pleasure tonight of meeting her two children, Amari and Alina, as well as her husband, Mehul, and her parents, and her sister, uh, and brother-in-laws were here tonight, yes. So um, we would, uh, um, at this time, um, President Brock, uh, we would like to uh, just just turn it over to you and, and formally um, announce Ami Gandhi as our next, as our new board member. Ms. Gandhi, on behalf of the board, and I welcome you to join us in serving this district of ours that we are all so very proud of. And your answers and your demeanor and your background really made you stand out as a candidate, and we are lucky to have you. It was so nice to see your family here earlier tonight and your adorable children leading us in the pledge. Um, I'm grateful. And uh, are they, they've left, have they not? They did. It was bedtime, so they left. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, the night I was elected, it was 5 o'clock in the morning when the results were finally coming in. My wife wakes me up at 6 a.m. So garbage has got to go out. You know, I've been asleep for a whole hour. That's how important being a board member is to a family, right? You know, it's like, there's no <laughs> sleep. Just go out there and take out the garbage. So they are, the, you and they are in for a wild ride. And it's going to be fun. And we're happy to have you. Thank you so much. I'm really looking forward to the opportunity. And that concludes my report. Wow. Okay. Uh, I have to follow that now with the report of the Southern California Regional Occupation Center board member. We finally got a cost per class 
which is something we have been trying to get for years, so that we actually know now how much it costs to run a class. Uh, we are looking at the future of SCROC, and we have some tough decisions ahead of us. And one of the, the ideas that came out of the meeting is we want it to succeed, but that might take some, some hard, hard choices. Uh, but it's better to, to really go back to what the point of SoCal RAC, so Southern California Regional Occupation Center. Its goal was to provide opportunities for districts to send their students when it was cost prohibitive for the district to have it. For example, we, Southern California Regional Occupation Center has um, dental assisting, right? But it's been really hard for our, our high schools to have dental chairs, or it'd be really hard for us to have, you know, cars to work on, or, or air conditioners, or, um, you know, veterinary services. <clears throat> so to really trying to get back to the, the fundamentals is what uh, SoCal Rock is looking at doing so that we can stay viable into the future. And that concludes my report on SoCal Regional Occupation Center. Are there any questions? I guess just um, the two districts that haven't been so nice with us, I, Inglewood and Torrance, are they sending students any, to, to Scrock anymore, or, or what's, what's going on? So Inglewood, no. Uh, Torrance, yes. And we essentially, um, we passed a resolution uh, supporting SoCal Rock, and so did Torrance. Uh, one of the issues that we've run into is when multiple districts offer a similar program to Southern SoCal Rock. Um, so we are looking and comparing our course offerings now with all the districts. Uh, for example, if you know multiple districts offer digital photography uh, in-house, there's no reason for SoCal Rock to offer digital photography. So that's one of the, the areas that we're looking at making those, those kind of those tough decisions um, so that we can stay viable. But no, so Torrance has been much better. Thank you. Okay. Um, Ms. Reed, do you have a report from the Peninsula Regional Law Enforcement Committee? I have a very brief report. And um, Matt, I just want to thank you, too, for your service to SCROC. Um, it's, it's something really important, and I agree with, like, as with a lot of things, there's going to be hard decisions to make, but I'm glad um, that you're going to be the one helping us guide our board to with our vote on how we're going to proceed um, with SCROC, so thank you. Um, as far as uh, the Regional Law Committee, um, uh, Ms. Taronis attended with me. They um, wanted to know um, how vaccination was going with our students, and I said, anecdotally at least it seemed, many, many had gotten vaccinated, and we were really excited for the next group of younger kids to start the process. Um, certainly all the kids I see um, have all told me they were excited to go get their shots, um, which usually kids don't feel like that, so that was nice. And I also shared with them about the retirement of our SRO at PB High, Officer Moses, and assured them that our staff was looking to replace him with somebody excellent. And that was about it. Um, as usual, we you know listened to the data on crimes and so forth on the peninsula, but there was nothing particularly noteworthy um, at this meeting. And Brenna will help me if I forgot anything. Captured it. We're good. That's. Thank you, Miss Reed. Uh, for some reason, I don't think you missed anything. I went to the uh, the I filled in for Penn um, for one of your the PTAs, and they read the letter that you had provided to them that was so clear, crystal clear and outlined everything. I'm like, I don't need to be here. Just what she said. <laughs> so I, I cannot believe you missed anything. Okay, so next we will move on to the COVID. 19 school and community updates. Ms. Kathy Berry, welcome. Thank you, President Brock. Uh, before we turn, turn it over to Kathy, I wanted to give the board an update on our PVDLA program. And so we, uh, we sent out notifications to all families and um, at the K through eight level, um, and the portal is still open until June 20th, I believe. And we have very few students interested. Um, so less than 25 students for the PVDLA and maybe five, maybe a little bit more an independent study. So we will continue to keep the portal open. Um, but at this time, if the numbers continue um, to moving forward to be this low, then we will likely call the families that opted for PVD to that opted for DLA K through eight. And, and let them know that their option would be 
independent study or coming back to school. We wouldn't have enough kids to be able to offer live school every day. Um, but we don't know yet. Maybe we'll get more, maybe we'll get enough to have a class where a teacher can teach you know, a class of kids live, but we're just not there yet. Um, in addition, we plan on opening the portal for, um, for high school and we need to notify the high school. It, it's staff's recommendation that the, the transcript will be from, uh, it, it, it looks like we'll get a CDS code, so the transcript would be from the CDS code if Dr. Katanda can continue to twist arms in Sacramento, which she's doing on a daily basis. Um, so it looks like we will get that CDS code, um, so that would kind of make the transcript, you know, where it comes from mood, it would come from the, our independent school. Um, so we don't need to quite make a decision tonight on, you know, whether it's a pen, PV, or RDM transcript. It looks like that um, we're going to be able to get the CDS code. Terrific. So, um, so that's, that's the report. Uh, we will come back to the board um, with updated numbers in a few weeks, but we do plan on opening the high school portal on June 1st, and that'll be open for about a month. Mr. Phillips? Yeah, so I mean, there are a number of public comments and there were a number of uh, comments during the town hall about um, the one-year commitment for the under-12 set. So what's the current thinking on potentially having a, you know, a shorter-term option that would allow the under-12 set to get vaccinated? Before? Yeah, I think, I think depending on what program we offer, I think we'll, we'll be able to, you know, have some flexibility there if there's a medical reason, like they're, they're, they just got vaccinated and now they're comfortable coming back. Um, so we, we will work with those families to, to try to be flexible. The whole, the whole point is to try to accommodate families, but also be sensitive to our needs to, you know, run a consistent program. But there's probably some families that are holding off making that decision because they, they, you know, because they'd, li they'd like, they'd like clarity on that, you know, that they think yeah. the one year commitment's long. So, I mean, I, I would agree. I would encourage us to try and find a way to accommodate. I, I certainly, you know, and it's not on the agenda, but I certainly am in favor of trying to find a way to accommodate the families that want their kids to get vaccinated and then would like to return to campus but don't want their kids to be on campus until they're vaccinated. Yeah. And whether that means once, you know, first semester, you know, first trimester or second trimester, um, you know, I we'll, think we'll, that, that's we'll look on that. Work we'll, on. we'll look at a way to, we'll look at a way to try to accommodate that and, and communicate that. Great. Yeah, I've heard similar concerns, so I would appreciate if you took a look at that. And just a quick question for the high school portal opening. So will that kind of be advertised that it looks like the transcript is going to come from the, um, the other school? Um, so, then, so then kind of families know it, it probably won't be coming from PV or Penn if that's what it looks like? Our, our hope is that the CDE will make a decision. Um, I have emailed everybody there. I talk to people in the office. I email them every day, sometimes three times a day. Um, and one of the staff members said that there's 160 schools that are waiting for a CDS code, um, but there's also 2,000 CDS codes for virtual schools that were established pre-pandemic. And so to not grant this 160 schools that have applied seems to be inequitable. Um, and giving LEAs the flexibility to be able to design a program that um, would be um, beneficial for their families and would meet their needs is really important to staff. And so that was the reason why they asked us to advocate to you know the deputy superintendent and superintendent's office of public instruction um so that being said i'm hoping that they're going to make their decision sooner than later um, and, and so yeah. it looks very and we possible. will we will communicate that in the communication to the high school that that is our intent is that the transcript would be from that. thank you okay nurse barry good evening things are a little quiet on the front of the Department of Public Health right now. I'm sure everybody is waiting with bated breath for June 15th to see how things are going to affect schools. And um, really the only other thing that's new is that Moderna has just been given their emergency authorization to also vaccinate students 12 and older. So there's another option for those folks who wanna get vaccinated. And um, that's it, there's not a lot happening right now. And this will be my last board meeting. So um, I want to thank you all. 
It's been an interesting ride to say the least. And uh, I wish you the best of luck in the upcoming months because I'm sure it's going to be another rocky ride. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I'm sure we all have something we'd like to say, Mr. Phillips. Oh, like no, 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 no. You've already oh, said yeah, it. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, 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 all no. no. It, I, you know, it's too late now. We've started the process. Uh, as, as I said last board meeting, I, I think that, uh, you know, C certainly, I could see a, a year that would make someone want to retire, but I, I think it, I, you probably were thinking about this ahead of time as well. But I think, um, without a doubt, uh, you showed the value of a district nurse who actually knows what they're doing throughout this crisis. Um, and I'm, you know, really thankful for all your contributions uh, to the community, to the district, and to the safety of the kids throughout your career, and, and especially in this last pandemic year. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks very much, Rick. Miss Reed. Mr. Sperry, you know how I feel about you. Um, I'm sad that you're retiring. You're a wonderful person. And um, just like our student board members, you're going to be very hard to replace. Uh, we'll, miss you, we'll miss you dearly. Thank you for your service to our students. It's been a pleasure for 21 years. Oh. Ms. Crawford. Thank you so much. Um, we really will miss you, and uh, like Mr. Phillips said, just it, like definitely this year has been um, an important year to have a district nurse. So, uh, so happy that you were on board with us, and all I can say is thank you. Um, so, thank you. I appreciate it, Man Megan. Thanks so much. Uh, and Miss Gandhi, this is our district nurse for 21 years, and uh, if you'd like to say, even just introduce yourself. <laughs> So I'm Ami. It's very nice to meet you. I just want to say thank you so much. Your reports have been great. So I hope you enjoy your retirement, and thank you for everything that you did. Thank you. Take care. Good luck. Thank you. Uh, Nurse Barry, uh, I appreciate your groundedness and your, your, your absolute steadfastness throughout this and uh, that the district benefited from your expertise and from your passion and your commitment. And I am grateful to have had the opportunity to work with you, and I wish you the absolute best of luck going forward. Thanks, Matt. I appreciate it. We're going to miss you. Thanks. I will be thinking of you. Maybe in about three months or so. <laughs> well, let's hope that no news is good news. And, uh, you know, <laughs> no, you, no. you come by and you, you just uh, come by and say hi and uh, see how we're all doing once in a while. I wish you all the best of luck. Thank you, Nurse Mary. Bye-bye. Okay, we will move on to the appointment of a district representative for the Southwest SELPA Community Advisory Committee. SELPA, which stands for Special Education Local Plan Area. Thank you, President Brock. So with us um, via Zoom, we have uh, Executive Director of Special Education, Ms. Kimberly Taylor, who will introduce our representative. Good evening, everybody. I'm here tonight to introduce Alicia Gates to uh, the board. I'm so thrilled that uh, we have an opportunity to get our parents involved at different levels. The Community Advisory Committee has been around for many years, and it's a group of parents, educators, and community members who are concerned about the educational needs of children with disabilities. It's an advisory capacity role. Um, the SELPA asks that the board um, approve and appoint an individual to be representative of our district. We currently have one representative, Dunia Borelli, and it is an honor to have a second um, representative, Alicia, join us. Alicia um, shared with us uh, that her interests include areas of um, autism, behavior management strategies, community resources, uh, early childhood education, what the IEP process means, speech and language, parent rights, social skills, transition and um, inclusion, and above all inclusion. So Alicia, it is really my honor to present you to the board this night, tonight as uh, the CAC representative for Palos Verdes um, with our SELPA. Thank you, Thank you so much, Kim. Oh, go ahead, please. 
Oh, I just wanted to say thank you, Kim. <laughs> nice to be here. Okay, is there a motion to approve Alicia Gates as the Palos Verdes Peninsula Unified School District PVP USC representative to the Southwest Special Education Local Plan Area Community Advisory Committee? So moved. Second. So moved and seconded. Roll call vote, please. Ms. Crawford? Yes. Ms. Gandhi? Mr. Phillips? Aye. Ms. Reed? Yes. Mr. Brock? Aye. Ms. Liu? Aye. Motion carries. <laughs> Congratulations, Ms. Gates. Good luck to you. Okay, well now we move to Measure M, Consumer Price Index, Index Adjustment. That is yours. Dr. Chernis, members of the board, we have our uh, chair for the Citizens Oversight Committee, Gretchen Karner, joining us this evening to report back from the Measure M meeting concerning the Consumer Price Index uh, adjustment and the vote, and uh, I think she's still joining right now. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Gretchen. Hi, sorry, lights too. Um, can everyone hear me? Perfect. Great. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Uh, good evening, Dr. Chernis, members of the school board and staff. I'm Gretchen Carner, chairman of the City Citizens Oversight Committee for Measure M. As you know, but perhaps maybe some of the viewing public don't know or remember, Measure M was passed in 2011 to replace two other local school funding measures that were set to expire. The voters in the school district approved Measure M with no sunset provision, and this measure authorizes a yearly assessment on all of our residents' tax bills to be collected and placed in a separate fund to be used by the school district for specific programs and services. Those services are uh, keeping classroom technology up to date, providing advanced academic programs in math, science, and technology, attracting and retaining the most qualified and experienced teachers and school employees, maintaining manageable class sizes, keeping textbooks and instructional materials up to date, provide advanced educational programs that help our students get into the best colleges and prepare for successful careers, keep neighborhood school facilities clean and well-maintained, and continue funding for art, music, physical education programs. It's important for the public to note that Measure M funds are not authorized to fund any facilities pro, uh, improvements. This is just for kids, uh, teachers, and, and things for the children. Measure M required that a Citizens Oversight Committee be established to, that was comprised of stakeholders like me, community members at large, parents of kids in the district, and also parents of kids who have um, graduated, so that we have a large cross section of uh, community members. And we're all he there to make sure that Measure M funds are properly collected, accounted for and spent on appropriate expenses. I've been on the committee since 2018 and have really enjoyed it. I would like to shout out uh, and specially thank my present board me uh, committee members who are Kristen Curran, John Letcher, Kieran Mohammaday. David Off Offenberg, sorry, Stacy San, Anthony Self Jr., and Jill Sarace. Their commitment to the mission of this committee is amazing. They put their time in, they always offer thoughtful discussions, and those th thoughtful discussions have resulted in our recommendations that I'm going to present to you tonight. One uh, ba of background so that we can make these recommendations is that one of our tasks is to review the annual audit of the Measure M funds collected and spent during the previous fiscal year so that we can see that make sure the funds were spent on the things that we that the board allocated those funds for. The district retained um, I Bailey LLP this year to collect that audit and while I've been on the committee Myself and the other members of the committee have demanded a robust and transparent report from the auditors so that we can be rest assured 
that Measure M monies are fully collected and applied to the programs and services that have been approved by the board for that term. We wanna make sure that we understand everything. And we've also been able to question the auditor who has uh, attended our meetings. And this year we uh, probed the auditor with some difficult questions and we wanted to make sure that we understood everything. And after all of that, the committee was satisfied with the auditor's report and confirmed that the district had collected and spent the Measure M monies appropriately. The second task of the committee um, is to make recommendations to the board regarding whether Measure M, the Measure M assessment should be increased by the consumer price index for all urban consumers in California, which is now set at one 0.57%. If this increase is approved, the assessment um, per parcel would be $461.74. The total estimated revenues from this would be about $9.2 million. The committee believes that this modest increase would be appropriate and in the best interest of the children who are the true beneficiaries of these funds. Due to the uncertainty of federal and state funding, among other things, the committee was unanimously in favor of recommending this increase to the board. Thank you so much for your time and consideration of the committee's recommendations. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you, Ms. Garner. So you said it was 1.7? 1 1.57. 1 1.57. Which is a very modest amount in typical Years past, it's been closer to 3%, like last year was 2.88%, I believe. And so, a, um, And it was a unanimous, unanimous recommendation by the committee. This was a unanimous recommendation by the Measure M committee okay. uh, to recommend to the board to approve this modest increase um, so that okay. the, a little bit more money could be collected which is super important for the kids um, based on you know budget cuts and the uncertainty of funding from the federal government and the state government. So we believe that the community would be behind, be behind this and that's what, that's what we would recommend. Okay, thank you. Is there a motion that the board approve the recommendation from the Citizens Oversight Committee to increase the parcel tax by the CPI in effect as of June 30th, 2021 for the 21-22 budget year? So moved, but it, and I also have a question after somebody seconds it. Yeah. Second. Okay, discussion? Um, so, I, yeah, I just am curious, and maybe it's more appropriate for Brennan, and I apologize for not asking and writing ahead of time, but I just want 1.57% seems low compared to what I've heard recently about inflation. Is that because it was a January estimate, or, or is it, it were, was, it, was it possible to have a number higher than 1.57? earlier in the year, and we had the actual bill wait No, 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 your mic. Sorry, yes, apologize. So it was determined earlier in the year where we were um, when this was established, and it actually specifies in the text what we have to use in order to be able to make this recommendation. Um, so again, we actually had quite a bit of discussion and have some fantastic members, so we, we took up some time with that. But again, there we kind of can come next year, and if there is an adjustment, Please. Ms. Crawford? Yes. Ms. Gandhi? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Aye. Ms. Reed? Yes. Mr. Brock? Aye. Ms. Liu? Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. The parcel tax proposed annual plan for the 21 22 budget. Okay, that's me again. Um, another task of the committee is uh, to pre present our recommendations for the allocation of the Measure M funds to the uh, school board. Um, this year with our new members, and I, think I wanna thank the school board for appointing all of those members. They're very thoughtful and an amazing group of people and uh, have a lot to offer. So I thank you for that. But after we had a lot of discussion, a lot of good points considered, 
Um, we still believe that the community is in support of allocating the majority of the funds um, or 85% of the $9.1 million funds that Measure M collects uh, to maintaining management um, of class sizes and attracting and retaining highly qualified teachers. Um, that, was, that was important to us. And then as for the remaining 15%, um, that's always a subject of a lot of debate and discussion among the committee. Um, and every year, you know, we try to decide which of the specific categories of things that can be funded by Measure M should get an allocation. And this year, just based on COVID and what's happened, um, we believe that we should, uh, that our recommendation is that the 15% should be allocated the same way as it was last year, which is um, a, to a collective group of categories, including advanced programs in math, science, and technology, retaining qualified and experienced technology staff, and keeping classroom technology up to date. Um, based on the last year of uncertainty and you know budget cuts and and from comments from Megan Crawford, who attended our last meeting, uh, which was super helpful, um, the committee believes that it would be most productive and helpful to the students if the district can use the 15% on any of these categories as the needs arise, rather than being uh, handcuffed to only spending 5%, for instance, on advanced programs in math and technology. And you know, if they need to spend 7%, you know, we want you, you, the board and the district to have the flexibility to use the funds for those three categories in whatever way you deem appropriate and as the needs arise. So we hope this flexibility was useful last year and we recommend the same this year. So the committee recommends to the board 85% uh, for maintaining management of class sizes and attracting and highly qualified teachers and the 15% the for the other three categories I discussed. Uh, thanks again. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you, Ms. Carner. Is there a motion that the board approve the recommendation from the Citizens Oversight Committee to adopt the parcel tax measure and proposed annual plan for the 21-22 budget? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Roll call vote, please. Ms. Crawford? Yes. Ms. Gandhi? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Aye. Ms. Reed? Yes. Mr. Brock? Aye. Ms. Liu? Aye. Motion Ms. Carries. Carter, thank you for your service. Please thank the members of your committee for your service. Uh, we appreciate your, your in-depth discussions and analysis. And uh, Mike, we thank you for the flexibility as, as well. So thank you so much. Have a good night. All right. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Okay. Board screen and appointment for members of the Facilities Advisory Committee. Ballots have been provided to each board member. You will please fill these out and then pass to Ms. Rogers. Ms. Reed, I guess you'll be texting because that's a, yours to Ms. Rogers. And you have her contact information? Excellent. Uh, so uh, for, I'm sorry? We put our names, correct? Yes. Yes. Uh, so for those who are not familiar, uh, we had many excellent applicants for the Budget Advisory Committee. And we felt that a lot of them would actually serve the Facility Advisory Committee very well. So we asked them if they would be considered to join the FAC. And these one, two, three, five agreed to be considered again for the FAC. The FAC stands for the Facility Advisory Committee, which will look at our facilities and our, our plans moving forward.
if you want to, if you want to abstain on this, you can, because you which is totally understandable because you were not you know part of the previous discussions. But if by no means am I saying you cannot. Ms. Rogers, if you would please read the results. And would you like the results by board member or just the total? It needs to be by board member. Um, Mr. Brock, Arif Karu, Desiree Myers, Barry Yudis. Ms. Crawford, Sarah Dean, Arif Karu, Barry Yudis. Mr. Phillips, Sarah Dean, Arif Karu, Barry Yudis. Ms. Reed, Arif Karu, Tom Palucci, Barry Yudis, with Ms. Gandhi abstaining. So if I'm correct, we had two candidates with more than, with three or more votes, which were Barry Yudis and Arif Karu. That's correct. Okay, so now we will choose between so and everybody else received one vote? Uh, Sarah Dean received two. Okay. okay. So now on round two, uh, please pick one. Doesn't have to be secret. They're going to say. Round two results, Mr. Brock, Sarah Dean, Ms. Crawford, Sarah Dean, Mr. Phillips, Sarah Dean, with Ms. Gandhi abstaining. Thank you, Ms. Rogers. Pardon, um, Ms. Reed, Tom Palucci. So we also had Ms. Gandhi abstaining on this round. So it looks like our FAC, We'll now add three members, Arif Karu, Barry Yudis, and Sarah Dean. Congratulations to you three. Look forward to working with you. We will next move to the approval of the Expanded Learning Opportunities ELO grant pursuant to California Education Code 43521B. Please let Ms. Wildly in. I beg your pardon, but do we need a motion on the vote? Okay, sure. Um, is there a motion that the board approve Arif Karu, Barry Yudis, and Sarah Dean to serve at large members on the facility advisory committee for a term from June 21st, 20, June 2021 through June 30, 2023? So moved. Is there a second? Second. And the roll call vote. Ms. Crawford? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Aye. Ms. Gandhi? Yes. Ms. Reed? Yes. Mr. Brock? Aye. Ms. Liu? Aye. Thank Motion carries. Thank you, Ms. Rogers. 
Okay, now we will go to the approval of the grant pursuant to Ed Code 43521, and we can let Ms. Wildly in. Thank you so much, President Brock. Members of the board, we are back for the approval of the ELO plan. At our last meeting, we did a presentation on the planned expenditures, and today we are pre presenting this plan for your approval. Uh, Ms. Wildy is here to answer any questions that you might have as well. Thank you. Ms. Gandhi, do you have any questions? You are, of course, welcome to abstain from this one as well, but if you have any questions, please feel free to ask Dr. Katanda. Uh, is there a motion that the board approve the expanded learning opportunities grant plan pursuant to California Education Code 43521B as presented? I'll move. Um, I'll, I'll second it, but I had a quick question, if that's, that's right. okay. Um, so I had a couple of questions from different community members. So I just wanted to clarify because we answered this before, but they still asked me again. So I just want to make sure I understand it right. Um, that the, especially like the mental health counseling and the classified expenses for for students are those for new programs and additional things, or is that a way of funding existing support, or is it a combination of both? So we are currently RFPing our mental health services, and we are going to right. make a recommendation that, right. um, for um, a potential expansion to the board at the next board meeting. Um, we're going to write to it this Friday, and then I'll let Mr. Ronas talk about the classified piece. And then one, one piece for the classified is, is we have a requirement to spend 10% of those monies on paraprofessionals. So right now we are in discussions of how that will look. So there is a very specific amount that, that's assigned to that. Okay, thank you. I think that clarifies it for all of us. Thank you. Um, and I second. So thank I'll, you. I'll just follow on because I, I know the next two items coming up are after we skip on our curriculum items. I notice this says curriculum as part of that. So are those being funded out of the, this ELO grant or are they being funded out of different monies? Those two are ELO. Those are. Okay, thank you. Okay, so it has been moved and seconded. Ms. Crawford. That the board approve the expanded learning opportunities ELO grant plan pursuant to California, California Education Code 43521B as presented. The roll call vote, please. Ms. Crawford. Yes. Ms. Gandhi. It was an abs abstained. Mr. Phillips? Aye. Ms. Reed? Yes. Mr. Brock? Aye. Ms. Liu? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Ms. Wiley, Wiley, thank you for being here. Sure, thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much. Good night. Have a good night. Okay, next we'll move on to discussion of board policy 6144, controversial issues. Please let public comment. Terry Nadal in. And Dr. Chernis, um, are you going to lead this one, sir? Or Dr. Katanda? So I would like public speakers to be able to go after we speak because then they might have more information to, to make their comment based. So Ms. Nadal, um, after the presentation is made on this topic, then you will have your opportunity to speak that way you kind of hear what we're, we're hearing at the same time. Okay, thank you, President Brock, members of the board. Board policy 6144 is presented um, as, as for a few reasons. One, this is a, we are in a, a politically charged climate where uh, politics sometimes um, pervades different aspects of our society, including the classroom. And so board policy 6144, um, we believe ad adequately addresses um, the procedure uh, and the method by which educators should um, review and, um, and ultimately discuss issues that um, could be controversial. And so this board policy speaks to the process. It speaks to um, the responsibility to consult with either the superintendent designee or a, or a site principal, if it's a controversial issue to talk about, um, to, to, to touch, we, we want our teachers to be able to touch base with their principals and say, there's, there's an issue that's, there's a theme in a book we're reading and it's going to bring up a contra controversial issue. Um, uh, this is what I was thinking of how to present it. And, uh, and then, 
and then get some guidance and, and respect. I, I think the important, the first paragraph of this policy um, states that instruction concerning such topics shall be relevant to the adopted course of study and curricular goals and should be designed to develop students' critical thinking skills, ability to discriminate between fact and opinion, respect for others, and understanding and tolerance of diverse points of view. And I think that summarizes it. Um, so our suggestion is to um, make sure that all of our principals have this and when we come back to school in the fall in our um, in our staff meetings um, to review this policy with with all staff so everybody is is very clear and and equipped to be able to handle controversial issues as they come up thank you sir yeah i'm all for it. if we don't have to create a new <laughs> we don't have to create a new policy and we have one that's that works let, let's stay with that. Um, also, I just want to make sure that we are equipping our, our staff with the tools necessary when controversial subjects are broached in the classroom, right? You know, how do they respond? How do they answer? So that, you know, is that something that we could look at professional development for? Um, just because, you know, these questions are going to come up or you're going to have one student say something to another and uh, just trying to give them the tools uh, very similar to what we've done with, with past curriculum so that they are in a position to, to best address it. Okay. Thanks, sir. Is there further? Did I, oh, yes, Ms. Dahl. No, you know, I told you to wait, and then <laughs> I'm so sorry. Please go ahead, ma'am. You have three minutes. You have to unmute yourself, please. Sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I was happy to see the discussion of AR6144 controversial issues on the agenda tonight. I wrote a letter to the board addressing two news articles about systemic racism that are part of my seventh grade son's language arts curriculum. The board members and Dr. Chernis received copies of these articles. In early April, my son's class was assigned an article from Newsilla which is a free online news as literacy platform. It rewrites news articles for different reading levels. Newsilla claims that they consider how a student will feel after reading an article. Therefore, no perspective presented on Newsilla will make students feel attacked or marginalized. The assigned article titled Analysis, Systemic Racism in Sociology claims that systemic racism is both a theoretical concept and a reality. It asserts white privilege and power and concludes that all white people play a part in perpetuating systemic racism. The teacher told us these articles were assigned as supplemental reading material. They were presented as fact, not as opinion pieces. Articles, content, or discussion offering alternative perspectives were not provided. After speaking with the principal, we understand that he gives autonomy to the teachers in their supplemental article selections. Another Newsilla article was assigned as a quiz with no teacher discussion whatsoever, titled Barbie, Yes the Doll, posts a video about racism that goes viral and for good reason. In summary, Barbie, the doll's black friend Nikki, also a doll, is treated horribly in two different situations while Barbie is not. Barbie concludes that means white people get an advantage that they didn't earn and black people get a disadvantage that they don't deserve. Scholars of history, sociology, and economics could argue the merits or flaws of the Newsilla article's assertions, but a captive audience of seventh graders without such backgrounds who are not offered alternative points of view or empirical evidence are at best failing to be taught critical thinking skills and at worst receiving indoctrination of a single perspective. When I wrote my letter, I didn't even know that AR 6144 existed it states controversial issues may be discussed in the classroom, provided that, and for the sake of time, I'll limit it to three of the nine requirements. Mr. Chernus addressed it, the first one, or Dr. Chernus. Uh, number one, the issue related, the issue is related to the course of study and provides opportunities for critical thinking, for developing tolerance, and for understanding conflicting points of view. Two, available information about the issue is sufficient to allow alternative points of view to be discussed and evaluated on a factual basis. Ms. Neither. Uh, I'm sorry, we, it's three minutes. 
so I have I, I have like literally four more sentences. Okay. okay. Neither of those requirements were met. Number three, the discussion does not reflect adversely upon persons because of the race, sex, color, creed, national origin, ancestry, handicap, or occupation. It says all white people play a part in perpetuating systemic racism. As a former teacher, I would be horrified to accuse any race of people as perpetuating something as atrocious as, race, as racism, let alone 12 year olds. I think these topics are super important and should be discussed and debated. I'm concerned about outsourcing supplemental curriculum to free websites that may or may not have political agendas and whether or not PVPUSD will provide our children with a curriculum focused on developing critical thinking skills and academic fundamentals or whether significant portions of curriculum will now be forced on teaching activism for a particular social vision. Please, please, let's teach our children how to think, not what to think. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Adal. Board member questions, comments? Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good night. You too. So, so when I read the, the BP and AR, I'm, I guess I'm loath to change anything in it as well, but um, you know, there's a, a piece of it which basically has, um, well, in the AR, it's, it's number four, which is all sides of the issue are given a proper hearing using established facts as primary evidence. And then in the uh, BP, um, it's number two, which is instruction shall be presented in a balanced manner, um, addressing all sides, I'm emphasizing all sides of the issue without bias or prejudice and without promoting any particular point of view. And I guess that kind of troubled me um, because well, two things. One, it seems like, unfortunately, we're in a world where um, there's more of a debate as to whether facts are facts or whether they're opinion now. Well, you know, and some people call it a post-fact world. Um, and the second is, um, you know, some, some views are just fringe, right? And, uh, uh, you know, and we're, um, you know, for example, like when we talk about the Apollo landing, I hope this is a fear and that we all share that, you know, there's a certain segment of society that believes it was a, a, mo a staged movie recording. And they point to, you know, the shadow angles of flags and versus the lunar lander. If we're required to teach all sides of an issue, uh, present that, you know, in a balanced manner, do we have to give credence to that theory along with the established, you know, what I believe the facts are that, you know, Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong actually did actually land on the moon as the first men on the moon. Okay. Uh, I mean, I think that's where it's, it's clarified where the superintendent actually has that discretion of whether it's controversial. So uh, un, un, under the AR, the superintendent is the fact arbiter, I guess. Yes. Is, is, so is, Dr. Is Turnus, did, did we land on the moon? Okay, so it's not controversial. No, but that's essentially, I'm not, I, I'm, make, I'm not really making light, but that is kind of where that cutoff is because yes, do you have to then you know, account for every fringe no, but I think that there is, I think reasonable people would know if a topic is going to be controversial in the classroom and whether it's age appropriate. I believe that our, our teachers would know. So, so like I said, I'm willing to weigh in to change anything because I think I trust our teachers too as well to, to you know, provide um, solid instruction. Actually, I'm kind of interested in what Sarah thinks, since so she's actually in our classrooms and we're not, uh, in, in terms of how controversial issues actually are, are addressed in the schools. Sarah. Yeah. So um, me and my AP Gov class actually had a discussion about both um, AR and BP uh, exhibits on the agenda tonight. Um, when we were talking about this, we also talked about how controversial issues are brought up in our classrooms as well. And um, we were discussing how being able to talk about different, let's say political issues, right? Um, how important it was to our own development to hear from different sides. Um, so we appreciate the, like we wouldn't change anything in either of the exhibits. Um, in fact, we appreciated uh, in AR 6144 that a teacher could express their personal opinion as long as it doesn't you know, it's not for the purpose of persuading someone or things like that. Uh, one thing that we did talk about, however, and nothing would have to be changed within 
uh, either B P or A R. Um, but one thing that we were discussing is in classroom discussions, we're concerned that teachers might not be equipped to handle misinformation or disinformation that students might bring up in the classroom. So for example, like Mr. Phillips was talking about, you know, the, the moon landing conspiracies, for example. If a teacher wasn't well versed in the in the issue, or um, you know, if we didn't have enough adequate like media literacy training, the concern is just that um, we would be giving validity and yeah, I guess credence to to different um, ideas that aren't necessarily based in fact. Um, but other than that, we just wanted to emphasize how important we thought uh, having giving students the ability to express their own personal opinions and and growing our worldview through critical thinking was. Thank you, Ms. Liu. I think that the important thing there too, right, is that it's, is this appropriate to the class, right? So uh, a staged moon landing might be appropriate for history class, um, but might not be appropriate for uh, PE, right? Okay, thank you. So we do not need to take any action on this. It sounds like we have a plan. And uh, Ms. Lou, I hope it's clear I wasn't making fun of you I, <laughs> by, by any means. I was, just, I was just trying to, you know, it's, these protections are in place, um, you know, for, and i really like to see these included in the, the, the student rights handbook, you know, the Bill of Rights that you guys did, because being able to express differing views is important and to feel safe enough that you can discuss it um, sometimes you're gonna people students are gonna have questions and they don't know the answer and they just they need somebody safe that they can talk to and know that they're going to get an answer um, but these the answers are getting more and more tricky as board member Phillips said with you know we don't even know what facts are anymore um, and that's why I really believe that we need to prepare our teachers as I think you mentioned um, as well to handle those questions okay we will now move on to U.S. History Textbook Adoption. Thank you so much, President Brock, members of the board. At long last, we are actually recommending an adoption um, to upgrade our, I think they're 2003 or 2006 um, history textbooks. Um, so this one is for our U.S. History textbook, and we actually had to extend our pilot for two years because of COVID. Um, so our intention was to actually adopt it at the end of last year. However, our teachers just didn't have enough time to review them, so we extended it, and now we're presenting it here. Um, and to address uh, board member Phil this question, we are recommending that we use the ELO one-time money for this. Um, and this is for the Savas United States History 20th Century California Edition. Okay. Uh, may we get a motion to that the board approve the recommendation ah, oh. <laughs> that the board approve the recommendation to adopt Savas Learning Company's United States History the 20th Century California Edition for use in the U.S. history beginning in the 21-22 school year. So, so, okay. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Roll call vote, please. Ms. Crawford? Yes. Ms. Gandhi? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Aye. Ms. Reed? Yes. Mr. Brock? Aye. Ms. Liu? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, next, we have a motion that the board approve the recommendation to adopt Savas Learning Company's World History, the Modern Era, California edition for use in the World History beginning in the 21-22 school year. Is there a second? Second. Okay. So I guess I moved it and seconded. Uh, roll call. Is there any discussion? Roll call vote, please. Ms. Crawford? Yes. Ms. Gandhi? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Aye. Ms. Reed? Yes. Mr. Brock? Aye. Ms. Liu? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. And let's make sure. I'm not missing anything. So item number 10, acceptance of gifts. 
Uh, is there a motion that the gifts of materials, supplies, and fourteen thousand three hundred forty-eight dollars and ten cents in cash received May first, twenty twenty-one, through May fourteenth, twenty twenty-one, be accepted as presented? Yeah, just really quick, I'd like to recognize that these gifts specifically are um, donations to the TTI program in memory of uh, Board Member Jeff Frankel. So we have um, over fourteen thousand dollars that has been raised in his name to the program. Um, so thank you so much to the community, his family, uh, PBFA for donating. Um, in his memory, he obviously had a big um, part in that program and was a very big advocate of it. And um, we're obviously very sad that he is not here with us, but I'm so grateful again to all the donors um, and his family who put together that GoFundMe page um, and everyone who kind of spread the word about that because it really will help our students. The TTI program is, is so amazing um, with Tara leading it and all of the students. So thank you to everyone. Um, over $14,000 I think is, is pretty wonderful. So just wanted to, to point that out. So thank you. Is there a second? Second. And, uh, any yes, I'll move it. <laughs> oh. You move before move, you start it. And, and, and I'll echo what Megan said, and I think it's a real outpouring of support for TTI and, and memory of, the, of Jeff's great contributions that over 80 people in the community donated to this, and PVFA as well donated to this program. And uh, I look forward to hearing TTI's plans for, uh, for you know, employing um, this donation on behalf of the students in the program. Any further discussion? It's been moved and seconded. A roll call vote, please. Ms. Crawford? Yes. Ms. Gandhi? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Aye. Ms. Reed? Yes. Mr. Brock? Aye. Ms. Liu? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll move on to the private email system for board members, which I know the title can sound a little nefarious, but uh, Mr. Phillips, this is your agenda item to add to the, the parking lot. So if you'd like to, to lead the way, sir. Sure, and I, uh, Beth, I sent you an email. I forwarded you an email. I don't know if it's possible to somehow display that. But um, basic, basically, there are certain emails that come to the board. Well, there's several situations that um, where you know emails come to the board or that exist among uh, you know board members and attorneys that I think it's appropriate that they not be on the district servers and so the question is in my mind how to set up uh, an email system that is solely for the board members but still is archived and available for PRA requests when appropriate um, or legal discovery when appropriate uh, and so that that's what I was trying to come up with a proposal for. I talked it over with Eric, and I think you know really the reason is if you think about the situations that we've been involved in, um, one of the obvious ones is that when we're negotiating with a superintendent, what their contract is going to be, and we want them to see a, a draft contract. It's really uh, you know something that we need to work out with our attorneys first, um, and it's really. You know, the, you know, and, and the attorney will work it out with Alex afterwards on, on behalf of the board. But while we're doing that back and forth, it's not something that it should be visible to anyone on the district staff. Another one uh, that previously occurred is that there was some suspicion among some c community members that their emails to board members were actually being flagged, um, and so that um, people, you know, that 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 there was um, that they were they were worried that they that when they raised a concern to a board member. That that information was going to the to the staff in the district, uh, and so I want to make sure that, that we alleviate that. But to me, I think what's important is all, also that the public's right uh, to you know access the district's records, which our emails are, uh, be preserved. And so, um, what I had proposed is this uh, system here, which is to basically set up another domain for just the board, um, and that. Uh, I, the, the one I'm familiar with is Google Gmail versus uh, Outlook. I'm sure it could be done with Office 365 somehow, but that then the controller of it um, would either be a board member or an IT person within our law firm, AALRR, so that the control of the keys to search anything or, or 
um, you know, um, you know, respond to those PRA requests or legal discovery would would then be under appropriate control. Uh, that there would be this Google Vault, uh, which is an archiving system, would be implemented, and so that it could be programmed to preserve records in accordance with our policies, uh, as well as to put litigation holds on uh, you know emails that were were appropriate, um, and that so that the public could still reach us in case they wanted to, they could still re reach us you know using our existing emails. Uh, especially during the transition period. And so anything that would be emailed to in number five to the existing PVP USD net, um, address would still go through the district servers. Um, but, you know, hope that that could be a transition period or that could be left in, uh, you know, permanently. And then when, when we mailed out of this domain to, uh, to staff that that wouldn't get caught by the various filters and would be whitelisted as an internal email essentially. So that, that was my thought and I'm sure Eric has some thoughts on it. Well, it is all technically feasible. So um, my apologies. I did not even make any of my greetings. So Board President Brock, members of the board, I'm sorry, I just jumped directly into answering the question. Um, <clears throat> my apologies for that. So I, I, I uh, we, we feel like family now after you've been helping us out so much here. So we feel like family. So don't worry. Right. About I feel like I was just cooking dinner and just came out to, to share it with everybody. So, you know, it's very, very casual. So my, my apologies for that. But um, no, the points that uh, Board Member Phillips brought up, um, we absolutely can do that. And, and just as it's outlined, it, it would definitely work. So. Not Google. Not Google. I know you hate Word and Outlook and all that stuff, but... We have to talk about that one. Uh, I, but seriously, on a serious note, though, Dr. Chernus, you can actually, since you, I believe, are the head person for the district, you can prohibit any keyword searches of board member emails. Could he not? Yes, absolutely. So that would protect at least at, at one level. If you, you know. Uh, Board member emails are public records requestable, but there's a process that needs to be gone through for that information to be obtained, right? It, it is now even that public records request is public. And so what I want to make sure of, no matter how we go, is that board member emails, unless required by law for certain keyword searches that the NSA wants, be protected from keyword searches from inside the district. Is that so, 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 so I'll say that those concerns about public emails to the board members did not occur when Alex. No, I, no, I, I complete. No, I'm sorry. I, I did under not mean a different to get that administration. Impression. Yeah, but I think that would. You can see where, if that policy is not in place it might be taken advantage of by, by someone who, you know, even thinks they're doing the right thing, um, but, but in reality are, are not. I have no real issue going with, um, with the new email as long as it is seamless and does not create any more difficulty for our constituents, our staff, or anything, right? So, um, I don't even know if there's a way that if we had, if we stay with pvpusd.net, is there no way to isolate that onto a separate, more secure layer? No, unfortunately not. And okay. that is because we, we would have access to, to any and all that fall under the umbrella of pvpusd.net. Yeah, and, and again, this is, you know, it's always important to say this is not a distrust of you or anybody. This is just, uh, let's just, sometimes you, you find things out and you're like, wow, okay. And uh, that happened, this happened. So let me pass this along to Ms. Crawford, Ms. Reed, Gandhi. Would this be two completely different email addresses? You would still use this. They would essentially be. Well, no, they couldn't forward to our PVP USD net ones because then you'd see it. It, it would. You'd have two. So you'd have a, one new one, you know, which we could all advertise, which be you know, P, whatever domains available, but something like PVP board. But if somebody used your old one, it would still go through the district server, but it would come to 
you know, your, your, new, your new email address. So would the new one just, what's the, I get, I'm just a little confused. So the new one would just be used for, for what purpose? Well, I think for, for anyone emailing us, it would just, we'd have different email addresses than the default email address for the rest of the staff, basically. Right, but if they would have to know the secure address to bypass, otherwise they're just simply going through the pvpusd.net server anyway. If, if they emailed from a district account, it would be on district servers. Correct, if, if but they, even even outside of that, even to the forwarding. Does it forward without reading? You know, so like if, let's say PVP USD not set up a forward, so it hits and then bounces right away. Is that still detectable? And that email box would still receive that email. And then it would also be forwarded. So we it would have to be up. two completely separate emails. One, you know, like in the military, they have the zipper net and then, mm -hmm. you know, the nipper net, right? So we'd actually have to have a zipper uh, uh, secure. We, yeah, no, so we'd advertise like we, you know, on that board member page, you know, we have our emails listed, for example. And so we'd advertise uh, our new email ad addresses. So you'd be, you know, Brock M at PVP board or, or some, some such thing or board, but whatever, you know, domain we could purchase that, that indicated that. And that would be the preferred, in, in this construct, that would be the preferred address, uh, you know, for the public to reach us or for, you know, staff to reach us or for us to, you know, email our attorneys from. Okay, uh, I, I hear you. I'm just curious if, again, with Dr. Chernis being in charge of the network as the, the superintendent, if he cannot simply say that you are not allowed to access board emails, period. No keyword searches, no opening them, no looking at them. And then, like, like I said, I, I, this is in part sparked by um, there were concerns at other points in time that, um, uh, you know, public public emails to public members of the public's email to the board were flagged to district staff that certain issues were being raised with board members. Right, which well, I understand, but I guess that was a different superintendent as well. Absolutely. And if our super, this superintendent is not doing that and understanding that doing that would be in violation of what the board has asked, um, I think that might be a way to resolve it. So I guess we have two options. One would be to um, to establish a, a secondary private email system for board members, or we can continue as is, or I guess the third choice would be then we can direct Dr. Chernis that board member emails are off limits except for during the public records request. Ms. Reed? Um, I guess I would say, I wasn't sure where this, where we were going with this item. Um, to me, this is a, a problem that we don't have um, right now. Um, I'm not sure we ever had it. We might have. Um, but we, I just don't see it's a problem that we have. Every email is, is PR able. Um, if you want to have a confidential conversation and all of our school board member training, we are told to pick up the phone and call somebody or go meet them in person and have a conversation if you want to have it confidentially. So that's how I've always behaved as a board member. That's how I'm going to behave in the future. Having the system or not wouldn't wouldn't change anything as far as what I would do. I think it seems like more hassle than it's worth, at least at this point, uh, for me. Yeah, but I think to be fair, Mr. Board wants to do something different, I will go along with it and be a good board member. But for me, I, I don't see. Well, I think Mr. Phillips' point was more that if, uh, Yes, as board members, we're we're aware of that fact, and you know, I'm, all mine. It says this is a public communication, right? But if you're emailing a board member with a concern, you might not know that somebody else has access to that information. That's not well known to the the community. Can I ask a quick question? Yes, ma'am. How how easy is it? Like you're saying, you have to submit a public record request. So, what does that process look like? Who wants to explain the PRA? Yeah. I'm sorry. I just no, 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 no. <laughs> no, that was not that was not directed at you. That was just like these. They're a lot of fun. It's a fairly easy process. It involves an email to me. So I can send you an email. It goes back and forth asking. You might ask for for certain records, and then if 
you know, that's just too vague of a request with regards to what your subject matter is, then I would go back and say, you know, let me help you clarify this request. What exactly are you looking for? Then we would, um, I would help you clarify your request so that I could see if responsive documents are available. It's not, uh, it's not a very involved process in so far as or in so much as um, what it takes to make the request. But if a request is vague without direction, then it becomes burdensome on staff and we can't find responsive documents. So we do have an obligation to work with the requester in terms of finding out what it is they're looking for and help them with that request. And how often do you get these requests? Um, we get them fairly often. Uh, it comes in waves depending upon what's on agendas or what's, on, what's in the climate of, of, of the board. Got it. Thank you. So is there, um, this is not an action item, I didn't, is it? I don't see a... I think it's the first time we've discussed it. Uh, and I do, and I would point out that certain of our emails actually are not PRAable, right? Like um, attorney-client privilege right. emails. Um, and so when we have certain types of litigation that are sensitive, uh, you know, that that clearly uh, is not something that would be subject to a PRA. Correct. Okay, so we, um, we do not need to take action on this tonight, but I think that it's understood what our end goal is, which is the protection of information, and perhaps um, you can bring that back with just uh, a couple of recommendations on how we can best achieve that with the, the minimal. So, 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 so it's agendized for direction for staff. And right. So, so the question is, well, we're, we're directing them to, to look at this and come back to us with the, no? Okay. Yeah, but again, well, we're I, I, mean, the, I think that we're, the real question is- We're trying to come out of a pandemic. Like, is this really what our staff needs to be spending more than about half an hour on at this point right now? I mean, I, to me, it doesn't. If the rest of you think it does, then speak up and say that it does. Because right now we're in three of us that have said something are in three different places. So I, I think, like I said, I, I kind of like outlined a system, I think, so that the staff wouldn't have to spend more than a half hour and that they could, we could just say, we either want to do it or we don't, so. Okay, so is there a motion to direct staff to proceed with a private email system for board members? We usually don't do motions for, for but staff. This is just an easy way for us but, to but, get direction. But, but, to sense, of the, sense of the board is what you're looking for, uh, right? Yes, so. So I, I, I certainly have that. Yeah, I would advocate for that, as, as I've stated. Do we have others who would advocate for that? Okay, so there is no direction to staff uh, to look into a private email system for board members. Dr. Chernis, I would seriously hope you consider what we've discussed about protecting and sending a, a guideline that board emails are not touched. Will do. Thank you. Uh, amendment to extend the superintendent employment agreement. Mr. Phillips, you brought this issue up. This was just, a, this is a clarification issue, correct? From Yeah, so there were basically, um, the, 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 the key issue was that when we extend the, Alex's uh, employment agreement for two years so that it wouldn't expire until January, th June 30th, uh, 2024, we didn't extend the notification date by two years. Um, and so uh, we now have done that by replacing paragraph six um, and including June 30th, 2023 as the date, the end date, outside date for the board to notify um, Alex of our intent to extend or not extend. Uh, and then uh, we also just, uh, in terms of completing uh, Alex's evaluation for the year and, and uh, doing all the various items, just wanted to, the parties wanted to agree that we have done them uh, except for this final action plan, which we will we'll do before the end, end of summer. Thank you, and Dr. Turnus, you have seen and agreed to this as well? Yes. Okay. And Steve Andelson re reviewed the document, although the version I'm looking at here doesn't seem to have it attached, but I thought that there was a version that had this attached. I saw it, I saw it. Um, so Was there any discussion? Was there a, a motion to amend, to extend the superintendent employment agreement? Um, basically, it is simply changing the, the date 
uh, uh, notice and not fundamentally extending his contract. I'll vote to amend it, but I'll, I mean, I'll move to amend it, but the, I guess what I'm worried about is I'm not seeing it come up on the system as attached. So if it's not attached, then I, I, I think we need. Okay, so, so in that I case, see. unfortunately, I, I think we need to. I see it online. They have it. Uh, you, you have an attachment? They do. I do. I don't have mine up right now. Is it because you're logged in though? And is it in close? I think that's what happened, unfortunately. So I think it's, 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 it's if, if you're logged in so that you can see the closed session items, um, it's there, okay. but the public can't see it. So I'm okay. actually gonna move to table it. Perfect, that's a good idea. Yeah, we need the public to see it so that we can approve it. Uh, but so next time, let's just make sure that it's visible to the public and we can move right through it. Okay, consent calendar. Item K3B has an updated resolution with uh, Board Member Gandhi's signature at the bottom, so sh it should probably be pulled just to note that it's a motion to approve the updated resolution 23 Exhibit B. The item was put on the agenda before AMI was appointed. Uh, sorry, that was my note from, <laughs> that was my note. Um, so is, do we have any motions? It looks like we will pull K3B. And uh, K4B. K3B, K4B. K3B, K4B. You got to make the motion to do with the rest of them then. Jeez. Okay, I'll move approval of K1A through K3A, K3C through K3F, and K4A. Well done, sir. Is there a second? Second. Let's move to second aid. Roll call vote, please. Ms. Crawford. Yes. Ms. Gandhi. Yes. Mr. Phillips. Aye. Ms. Reed. Yes. Mr. Brock. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Okay, so as of the resolution, I'm going to the bottom, so shall we pull just to note there's a motion to approve the update resolution. Okay, so if you please make that motion. You have? Thank you, is there a second? Second. A roll call vote, please. Ms. Crawford? Yes. Ms. Gandhi? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Aye. Ms. Reed? Yes. Mr. Brock? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. And Aries, our old it's friend, a, back again. So the reason, and the reason I pulled it is only because we agreed a year ago to compete it. I know we did. We had changes with uh, Trent leaving, um, and uh, I know it's a, a big pain for us to potentially replace it because a lot of us. But I, I, I still think, uh, you know, the, the costs have drastically increased for implementing Aries over the years. It used to be a great deal when we were, you know, one of their initial customers, and now it's gotten very expensive each year and so I would like to next year at least have us compete and not just show up as a renewal but I'll move approval of uh, k4b as is second Roll call vote, please. miss Crawford yes miss Gandhi yes mr. Phillips aye miss Reed yes mr. Brock motion carries I'll go just quickly. Um, first of all, welcome Ami uh, to the board. I'm so happy that you are here with us uh, tonight and I know you're going to be a great board member and put in all the time and effort and ask questions. We ask lots of questions and are continuing to learn. So, so happy to have you here with us tonight and meeting your family and um, 
kids that was really nice to um, to meet them so welcome and a couple other things I saw that we have uh, Pally back on the list for next year uh, for science camp for um, Onata Bay and PVIS so that makes me so happy that again we're getting students out um, with outdoor learning especially at the middle school level so that's exciting and teachers and staff we have 10 more days of school we can do it you're almost there um, I believe in you um, this has definitely been the hardest uh, school year I've had by far but um, the students appreciate every single thing that you're doing so just make the most of these last 10 days and hopefully we will not deal with uh, this again next year so good job we're almost there I'll go. Um, well, welcome to AMI, and you survived basically your first board meeting. So th thank you for putting up with us, and we look forward to uh, working with you through the next uh, year and a half, I guess, till, till you have to face the, the, the ballot process. Don't worry about it. You know, I'm, I'm sure you'll do great and in, 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 in win in a land, landslide, should you choose to run. Um, a couple of things. Well, the easiest thing is uh, my next coffee will be uh, Sunday, June 6th at 1 p.m., um, you know, we have, you know, some of our long-term initiatives, despite COVID, uh, we actually did get something accomplished this year, which, and, and I'm thinking specifically of semester and break ending prior to um, the Christmas and holiday breaks. And I think that was wildly popular and appreciated by the student body of Sarah still with us. I'm sure she would give it a thumbs up. Uh, and then uh, another one of the long-term initiatives that we've talked about is actually trying to go to a seven-period middle school day. And so uh, I don't want us to lose sight of that because I do think it's important to, to go to seven, per seven periods in middle school, both because of um, the increased need for interventions next year and, and to support learning loss, and then also uh, to support increased elective choice, which a lot of our families, you know, are kind of given Occam razor kinds of choices. So I would advocate that we continue to work on finding a way to do seven period middle school. And if that means that we, you know, have extra point two, so be it. Uh, if we can provide more opportunities for, for our kids. Then um, I've gotten a lot of emails, and I suspect the other my colleagues on the board have as well, about stuff that's going on at the State Board of, Elect of uh, Education, not at our board, uh, regarding math. Uh, and I would encourage our community to advocate uh, for their beliefs at the state level when the state is considering changes uh, that potentially could flow down. But you know, as I've always said, the state sets minimum requirements. They don't set the requirements or the maximum requirements for our district, and so I think it's very important to maintain the principle of local control and that we're allowed to exceed the state standards where we think it's it's appropriate. I also will say that uh, I certainly feel I was the beneficiary of uh, advanced math classes, and uh, I think my kids were, and I think that uh, there's a huge segment of our of our student body that is the beneficiary of math classes and I don't understand why you'd hold any kid back who has the capability of advancing in any subject whether it's math or something else it just happens to be that the state's considering changes in math right now so I'm not at all on that page where some of the state math framework recommendations are coming out then I wanted to talk about the great work that uh, the PTSA uh, Diversity, Equity, Inclusion uh, Committees have done and that I've witnessed over the last week. The first was on Sunday and actually leading up to it, but um, and Linda participated in this as well, is the film Crip Camp, which I highly recommend to everybody. Uh, and it talks about, uh, you know, basically the the a camp it starts out with a camp essentially for disabled kids where disabled kids were treated normally uh, and the kids that went to that camp then became the nucleus of the disability rights movement and this is one of the things I don't understand about like this was a whole civil rights movement that occurred essentially in the 70s but it's not in our textbooks but it's a really great story about civil rights in uh, America that occurred and somehow uh, the Penn PTA was actually able to get the icon of uh, this, the, the disability rights movement actually to participate in a Zoom webinar panel discussion 
in our community, Junie Newman, who's like somebody that people come up to on the street and like would say, oh, can I have a lock of your hair? You did so much for, for, for you know, my family. And I thought it was absolutely amazing. The, the film itself I thought was amazing and the panel discussion that the PTA put on I thought was outstanding. Um, and the film's available on YouTube and on Netflix. And I believe the uh, panel discussion uh, the PTA has also made available on YouTube and I highly encourage people to watch it. It made a, a big impression on me. Secondly, uh, there's another project going on at one of our school sites, which is Dapple Gray Elementary, where they've got the Legacy Art Project. Uh, and that was uh, led by the DEI committee, and the project was led by Yvette Gallardo uh, Delia. And I, I, it's got remarkable stories of the grandparents, mostly of many of the Dapple Gray students. Uh, I went there yesterday, and it was, uh, I encourage everybody to visit the project. I, my understanding is it'll actually, uh, after the school year, go to the PV Library District at the Penn Center Library for everybody to see. And the posters were actually printed by our own print shop, so that was something uh, that our print shop uh, contributed to in the community, but I, I think that the stories are pretty amazing that are detailed on those posters. Um, and I encourage you to go to Dapple Gray and just look at all the posters in front of the school. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, Ms. Reed. A um, couple quick things. Eric, I want to thank you for your technology help today. Um, I can hear all of my colleagues. I can't see them, but I can see everyone in the audience, including Eric sitting in the back hiding. So thank you so much <laughs> for your help. Um, uh, on the consent calendar, my question would be just following up on how the fundraising is going for the Penn High Field. I can't remember if I asked that before, but I don't think I'd seen any recent numbers. Um, this 439000 was the completion, and that was just a small part of it. That was the field turf, and it looks great. And I saw that the Penn High girls lacrosse team won today. Very exciting. Um, so hopefully they'll be getting to play on that field again. Uh, thank all of our principals and assistant principals for all their work over the last month. Um, and on uh, a request as a board member with, uh, with the understanding that we are all doing the best we can during this crazy year. And that is, I think it'll help us prepare more and more effectively going forward if on some of these board items, if we can just have a heads up on where we're going with them or what the reason for them is so that we can prepare questions or put some thought into some of these items. Um, and lastly, I just want to welcome Ms. Gandhi. Um, I encourage you to vote on, on everything. Um, you certainly have a right to do that, and um, we want you here to share your thoughts, so speak up uh, early and often. Um, all of us are available to help you, but most importantly, we're all here to learn from you as well. And um, so welcome, and we look forward to uh, some great conversations going forward. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Ms. Reed. And Ms. Gandhi. I just wanted to say thank you to all of you. Um, I'm really excited for this opportunity. It was, you know, sitting through three meetings today. <laughs> um, I have a lot to learn, so I was a little more quiet today. But I look forward to participating, and I'm, I'm just, I'm really happy. And I'm excited for the opportunity. So thank you to all of you guys. Thank you. Uh, and then uh, just I want to talk about your, your math uh, comment uh, for a second ago. Dr. Katanda is, uh, was, was twisting arms up there again uh, about this. I actually heard about it from, uh, I think it was uh, Senator Allen's uh, legislative assistant. And um, I'm like, oh, yeah, I think that was uh, ours. And she's like, yep, yep. <laughs> making friends, Air Lindsay, making friends. So thank you for, for your service. And it seems like that's all I do nowadays is say thank you, thank you, thank you. But it's legitimate. I mean, everybody here does so much. And they make all the difference. And sometimes it's all I can do is say thank you. So with that, I see no other business before the board. And we are adjourned at 9.15.